Good morning. It's nine o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time, in March the fourth, twenty twenty-one. Beautiful day here, in North Central Texas. Have uh, sunny, going to be warm. Very unlike the last couple of weeks that we've experienced in this part, of Texas. Well, in all of Texas, it looks like. We want to say a very special welcome to the Fred Florence Young Men's Leadership Academy of Dallas ISD. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. This is just for our attendance records only. Today, we're going to do adaptations of animals. During this virtual field trip, students will examine art organisms of their structures and use dichotomous keys for identification, explain variation within a population or species, and identify some changes in genetic traits that have occurred over several generations through natural selection and selective breeding. Isn't that a fine looking bunch of animals, especially the one right in the middle? Uh, Ms. Ramirez is gonna to talk to you about dichotomous keys. Ms. Nash will talk about variation. Mr. Monroe will explain natural selection and Ms. Fuller will talk about selective breeding. You cannot verbally ask us questions, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question space answer and answer. Ask us questions and we'll do our best to answer them during the program. If not, we'll send the answers to your teacher. Now I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. And Ms. Ramirez is going to talk to you about dichotomous keys. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're going to be learning about dichotomous keys and how to use them. So to start off with, I'm going to show you guys uh, a little uh, display that I made when I was in college. And this is a insect display. Um, so I took an entomology, I took several entomology courses and entomology is the study of insects. So here are some of the insects that I collected and I had to identify. Now the way I identified them, I had to use a field book and I also had to use what are called dichotomous keys. So today we're going to practice using uh, dichotomous keys to identify these two insects that I have here. And we're gonna walk you through that process. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys so we can start our presentation. So let me get that going. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna talk about really quickly is just a quick history of the dichotomous key. Uh, so a dichotomous key is used to identify an unknown organism. And identifying organisms help scientists to understand an area's biodiversity and any changes that might've occurred. So a dichotomy key can take many forms. It can use images, it can use yes or no statements, it can use either or statements, and it's just a way to help us identify organisms. So dichot means divided into two parts. So dichotomous keys are usually divided into a series of two questions. And uh, there's been some debate over who created the first dichotomous key. Um, the first textual based dichotomous key uh, was created in 1778 by John Baptiste Lamarck, a Frenchman. And you can see an example of his a dichotomous key that used text. Uh, but then uh, an Englishman named Richard Waller, uh, some people credit him with creating uh, the first pictorial dichotomous key, and that was back in 1689. So it kind of depends how you how you want to ask it. So the first pictorial dichotomous key was in 1689, and then the first text-based dichotomous key was in 1778. So let's take an example, a uh, look on how we're going to use our dichotomous key. So here's that insect that I showed you guys earlier. We're going to use a dichotomous key to help us identify the order that this insect belongs in. Uh, so maybe you guys remember uh, the classification system. Uh, so we're in kingdom animalia because we are looking at an insect and an insect is an animal. Uh, we're in phylum arthropoda or the arthropods. And we are in the class insecta since we know this is an insect, it has six legs. But what we're trying to figure out right now is what is the order? So what is the subdivision of class insecta that this one belongs to? So with our dichotomous keys, we always start with question number one. So let's look at question number one. It says, does this insect have wings? And it says either yes or no. So we can look at our picture here and we can determine that yes, this insect has wings. 
So if we take that look where it says yes, we're going to follow the directions. It says go to steps two. So we're going to go to step two. Of course, it's because they like to feed on love. Let me close that one. So we're going to go to step two. Uh, step two says, does this insect have parallel wings? And now sometimes in a dichotomous key, you might not know what some of the terms mean. So you might have to look them up. In this case, this dichotomous key tells us what that means uh, for parallel. So if we look at our uh, insect here, it does have parallel wings. Uh, so it says, yes, we're going to go to the directions and it says go to step three. So now we're going to go to question three. It says, does the insect have a parallel line down the back that divides the wings? So we took a look at our specimen. It does have a parallel line that divides those wings. Um, and since the answer is yes, we finally come to a stopping point. There's no more further directions. Instead, we now have an identification. So we know that this insect belongs to the order Coleoptera. And in fact, I know that this insect is a super cool insect called a fire researcher, also called the caterpillar hunter. So you can see in this video on the bottom, uh, the fire researcher is devouring a poor little caterpillar that it found um, and it's slowly eating it away. Uh, so these are super cool predatory beetles that you guys can find out here in Texas. Um, obviously don't pick them up. They have super big pinchers that can hurt you if they bite you. Plus they also have scent glands that can release a, a nasty musty odor um, if they feel threatened. So that's one dichotomous key. Another type of dichotomous key that we can use is a pictorial version, and it might be in a flowchart form. Uh, so here's that insect I showed you guys earlier. Again, we're going to try and find what order this insect belongs to. And uh, as always, you start with number one, or in this case, it's a flowchart form. So you start at the very top. So our two options are winged or wingless. So we take a look, and we know that this insect is indeed winged. So now we're going to follow the floor chart down and we have two more options. Um, are the front wings hardened or are they membranous? And we can tell that they do look rather thin and membranous. So we're going to go on this side now. Um, and now it tells us to go to the next page, page 61. So before we go to the next page, this little video that you see over here is this insect. It's a cicada killer. It's a type of wasp and you can see it is attacking that uh, cicada. Now the interesting thing is the adult uh, cicada killers are not actually killing the wasp to eat it. They're actually killing the wasp to bring it back to their nest as food for the larva. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then, uh, so we're on the second page because it told us where to go. Um, so now our two options are two wings or four wings. So take a look at our specimen. We're observing it really closely and we can see it indeed has four wings. Uh, so we know it has four wings. Now we're going to follow our next set of options. Um, does it have wings with few or no scales or wings covered with scales? Uh, so we see that it has a few or no scales. So we're going to follow the flow chart again down. Now it asks, uh, does it have wings with a uh, fringe of hairs or no fringe of hairs? Um, and we can tell it looks more closely related to this wing type. Uh, so now our next direction is it tells us to go to the next page. So we're going to go to the next page. Here's our next page. It says, does it have wings that are equal to the front and the hind wings or are the hind wings smaller than the front wings? And we can indeed tell again that the hind wings are smaller than the front wings. And again, sometimes you might have to uh, do research on what these terms mean uh, if, if you don't know what the words or the vocabulary words that are being used in the dichotomous key. So we're gonna go ahead and click that its wings are smaller than the front wings. Now we have two more choices. Does it have long abdominal appendages or an abdomen with two to three thread-like tails? Uh, so we can see that it has no long abdominal appendages. So it comes to our next two set of questions, tarsi two or three segmented. So look at the legs or tarsi with more than three segments. And we can look at its legs and tell that there are more than three segments. Uh, so we're gonna click over here. Our next set of options, does it have antenna that are shorter than the body or antenna that are as long as the body? And we can see that they are indeed shorter than the body. And then finally, we have no more steps to go and it gives us our order. So the order is Hymenoptera. Uh, so again, this is a cicada killer, it's a wasp and it belongs to the order Hymenoptera. So that is how we use our dichotomous keys. So again, we always start with question number one or at the top, we answer the yes or no question or the either or statement. And then we follow the directions that it tells us to go to. Again, sometimes 
uh, your dichotomous key might not have your answer. So sometimes you might have to use another dichotomous key or you might have to resort to a field guide or maybe the internet to help you find your answer. And then you might even have to use some research to help you understand what some of these terms are. And if you want to look up uh, and identify some insects that you guys might find at your school at the house, you can find that same dichotomous key at uh, the Purdue Extension website and it's listed above here. And these are just some cool Texas insects uh, that can be found here in our very own state. And then my challenge question for you guys, see if you can identify this insect order right here. So I have two pictures of the same insect. Uh, so you can use this dichotomous key to see if you can identify the order that it belongs to. And if you're interested in identifying things around your school or at the house, uh, I have some websites listed here that are great uh, to help you identify insects that you might find. Uh, so this one over here from the Florida Bug Club is a super easy dichotomous key because it uses pictures if you're not familiar with some of those insect body parts or some of those terms. And then there's the more advanced ones from the Amateur Entomologist Society and the Bug Guide. So great resources for you guys. And if you're interested in insects, uh, the Texas A&M Department of Entomology has a great bachelor's and master's degree program. There's all sorts of cool jobs that you guys can find uh, related to insects. Uh, so I'll be the first to admit, I did not like insects. It wasn't until I got to college and I got a job in the entomology department and I was like, wow, this is really interesting and cool. Uh, so I'll be the first to admit, yes, I was one of those people that was totally afraid of insects and would even scream and all sorts of things when I saw them. Uh, but I slowly learned that they are really fascinating. Uh, so I'm going to stop my screen share and that is all I have for you guys today on uh, dichotomous keys and insects. We're going to pass it back to uh, Dr. Borman and he's going to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. And the question came in before you actually covered it. Uh, what class did you take in college to study the insects? And you covered that very thoroughly. You took entomology class. Uh, thank you. And now. Ms. Nash is going to cover variations for us. Hello, welcome to my classroom. Today we're talking about variation and adaptation. So variation in behavior is what we're going to focus on in this little set. So variation in behavior is key to survival in today's world for the animals around us. So variation okay, is a key to adaptation and evolution. And what we're going to do is look at some common animals that we find around us that we can observe probably in parks around. You can listen for them, watch for them, look for them. And you can start observing how their behavior, we're going to focus on behavior, how their behaviors vary. Okay? And think about how that variability in behavior has either put them in a good position to survive or Unfortunately, in some cases, a bad situation. Let's look at some, what happened? What? Well, hang on, I went away somehow. Let me start over again. Sorry, God knows. There we go. So this is an animal that's all around us. You may not see it, it's mostly nocturnal. So if you want to find evidence of our beaver, you need to go out and look for two trees or maybe the slides they make, or maybe look for a burrow. So all animals have physical and behavioral adaptations that help them survive. Beavers are one of the few animals that engineers its own habitat. They build dams to create the ponds they need. In places where the water freezes, they build lodges to survive the winter. So wolves and bears are really the only predators that can even attempt to breach the lodge, pretty tough piles and piles of, of logs and, and mud. And humans, sadly, almost eliminated beavers through hunting in previous centuries. They made hats out of their fur. But that ended that. Fashion ended, I guess, and today they're expanding their range, and can, and they've been reintroduced in various places. And today they they can be found all over, even in the city. Okay. 
Park. So I live near Athletic Park, and we have a lot of beaver there. And right out here, we used to have them when our ponds were in better shape. They come and go. When our ponds fill with water, we have some beaver. When the ponds dry up, the beavers leave. They need water. Now, a, vari a variation in their behavior, depending on where they live in our country, because they live from Canada down into Texas. And in Texas, we don't have these big lodges usually. And that's because the pond does not freeze. Although this winter, ours froze. But even, even with that big cold snap we had recently, White Rock Lake, where I lived, in, it froze around the edges, but the center of the, of the lake remained open. So beavers, because they need to be able to go out and get food, have to have in Texas, they just build their their home in a bank of the of the lake or the creek. Okay. So up here we see this one is from from White Rock Lake, okay. uh, one of the creeks that feeds into White Rock Lake. And you see, they've made a, a burrow in the bank. It's a lot less work than building a giant lodge. The giant lodge, however, like this one here, it's covered in snow and an icy lake. So the entrance is underwater and the beavers in these areas have stashed food underwater for the winter and they can come and go to the underground tunnel and survive the winter underground under the water their food is safe not to chill and be refrigerator and so that's a difference in behavior a variation in behavior depending on where they live and here's one of our urban survivors, okay, <laughs> the coyote. So originally coyotes were, were confined to the, the Great Plains. Okay. In the Eastern forest, there were wolves, okay, but no coyotes. Okay. As the forest got cut down and wolves were eliminated, people didn't like them around. They were afraid they were gonna eat their cows or sheep or whatever. So they killed off the wolves. Wolves don't like to have coyotes around. They view them as competitors. So when people eliminated the wolf, the coyotes saw a chance. And also because the forest had been cut down, there were more open areas that they kind of like. So they've expanded their range. There are more coyotes now than ever in history. Okay. Coyotes in the north are slightly larger and tend to have thicker coats because of course they have to deal with snow. But you can see these guys all around. They are often out in the daytime. You can hear them at night. They are very good parents. Okay? They take care of their babies. Okay? And they're very intelligent and adaptable. So they're very anxious. They're able to, they can vary a lot in their behavior because they're so clever. And they're adaptable. They can eat a wide range of food, they can scavenge, they eat dead things, they eat fruits. Here, out here, we find them eating lots and lots of grasshoppers. In years when we have lots of grasshoppers, their scat is full of grasshopper parts. Okay? So they will eat almost anything. Another animal who's been able to adapt to human presence, even though they were almost eliminated in most of their range, and they still, our population in Texas is very, very spotty. But they were here originally, lots of black bear. Um, but they figured out that they can hang around where people are too, and they can eat bird seed, they can get in the garbage, and they're very adaptable. However, in the wintertime, in the north, they do go into a semi hibernation called torpor, actually, because they do wake up occasionally. Um, in the north, they go in for months at a time. In the south, they may not have to do that, although females will still go into it, make a den to give birth. So again, they're very intelligent creatures and they've learned to adapt to human presence. They have changed their behaviors to adapt to human presence. And they also change their behavior depending on what part of the country they live in, the climate. Another one that people go crazy over and we have a few of them here, but not as bad as they do in other places, is the Canada geese. They're not Canadian geese, they're called Canada geese. And they used to migrate 
But now they have figured out that that's a lot of work and they can stay in the parks and golf courses all year round and they make a big mix. Okay, so geese are one of the few birds that can eat grass. Okay. And they eat lots of grass and it goes in one end and out the other really quickly. Okay, you may have heard the expression like grass through a goose and that's what they're, they're a tremendous mess. Okay. So they try to control them with um, border collies chasing them around. Coyotes will also help control them. So maybe we'll have a new balance being struck between the urban coyotes and the urban geese. So beavers, coyotes, and Canada geese have become common residents in city parks all around the country. Our former apex or top predators like wolves and mountain lions were less adaptable to human presence. They're bigger, okay, people consider them more, and they are in fact, I mean, pumas, uh, mountain lions can be really dangerous. And so, and wolves are big, they live in big packs, okay, so they can be, seen as a threat right, by humans. So that we've eliminated those apex predators, those top predators, and in return, we have more coyotes and other smaller animals living among us. Okay, that's the last one. And so that's all I have for you today. And I wanna encourage you to begin observing all these wonderful animals that are sharing our space because they are rising to the challenge. The biggest challenge that they face since that asteroid hit the planet is us humans. Okay? We're changing all kinds of things about the planet. And it's interesting to see who among us, what other animals among us, has the kind of ability, okay, the variability to allow them to adapt and survive in this new world. So thank you. And Dr. Roman will answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Nash. <clears throat> and the uh, question was that we have a personal experience of an animal adapting uh, variations. And yes, we do, or I do. Uh, I live in a rural area <clears throat> and uh, we, when I first moved in about 15 years ago, uh, we were the only house in a large area and the cow, coyotes were just everywhere out there. But now uh, there's only very little bit of land left for them. However, they still live there. And now instead of chasing the rabbits and things like that to eat the natural things, they are real good about getting in your trash. So our homeowner association uh, makes it a rule that we can't put our trash out till early in the morning. We can't put it out overnight like we used to because they can smell a hamburger, I think about a mile away and they will tear your trash apart to get what's left in your trash. So they have adapted, they're eating everything now, not just their natural food. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Nash, for that interesting program. Mr. Monroe is gonna do natural selection. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be looking at a process called natural selection in population. And you know, natural selection is a process that can cause micro e e evolution. And what that means is there's a change happening through natural selection in the allele frequencies with fitness increasing alleles becoming more common in the overall population that we are studying or that's being studied. Now, when we talk about fitness, we're not, gonna, we're not talking about big muscles or stamina or endurance, but with natural selection, it is a measurement, fitness is a measurement of the reproductive success, how many offsprings and organisms leaves in the next generation as related to the others in the same group. So only the strong survive in natural selection is the ability to keep the species reproducing and not going to that point of being extinct. And I'm not gonna talk 
any more about that until after we come back from this short PowerPoint. And I want you to bear with me as I prepare to use a PowerPoint to give you a little more detail. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Evolution and natural selection. Uh, first of all, definition of evolution and natural selection was one of the goals that we're going to be trying to reach in this presentation. We're also going to describe the four steps of natural selection, given an example for each, explain the importance of variation, and Ms. Nash has just done that for you. Number four, how populations and species respond to environmental changes. And number five, list five evidence that support the theory of evolution. Now, we're not gonna be able to cover all of those simply because I do not have a lot of time with you today on your virtual field trip. The theory of evolution, the process of change over time, especially a change in the frequency of a gene or an allele in a population over time. Charles Darwin is considered to be the father of evolution. He proposed a mechanism for evolution and that was natural selection. Darwin went on a five-year trip around the world on the ship, the HMS Beagle. As the ship's naturalist, he made observations of organisms in South America and the Galapagos Islands. Now, he also wrote a book called The Origin of Species. Darwin's study on finches, he looked at the shape of the beak and how it was adapted to the diet and environment of the finch. Each finch ate a different diet, so they occupied a different niche, and it created a variation in their beaks, simply because over time, the nourishment or the food that they were consuming had a bearing on the ability to make that beak adapt to the type of food that it was taking in. Now, natural selection, organisms that are best adapted to the environment survive and reproduce more than others. Adaptation, an inherited trait that, is in, that increases an organism's chance of survival. It can be behavioral, meaning the organism's actions, or physical, the structure, okay? Or it could be a physiological tra uh, trait. Darwin's theory of natural selection occurs in four steps. Overpopulation, variation, which Miss Nash covered with you, competition, she even mentioned that, and then selection. You know, out here at the Environmental Ed Center, we see how overpopulation can keep a species going. For example, once a year, we have aquatic turtles that live in our bodies of water out here, the pond and the lake, and those aquatic turtles, such as the red ear slider, even the snapping turtles, the females will come out of that body of water, take a little time, probably about 48, 48 hours to develop or, or build a nest, lay their eggs, and then they go off and leave those eggs in the nest. When those little eggs hatch, there is an abundance of number of eggs simply because nature has planned it to where it recognizes that some of those little turtles, once they hatch, they have to find their own way to that body of water that their parent came from. And a lot of them do not make it. And because of the overproduction of the offspring, those little turtles have the ability to keep the species going because some of them actually make it to that body of water from which their parents came from. Each species produces more offspring than can survive. And that's what we mean by over uh, popul populated. Which community has a better chance surviving a natural disaster? Well, if you look at this, these images, here we don't have that many live specimens or species. 
Over here, there is a, a diverse number of living organisms. I would dare say that this probably is the one, community A, probably would be uh, a community that would be, be able to survive a natural disaster. Competition. Individuals compete for limited resources, food, water, space, and even mates. Natural selection occurs through survival of the fittest. In this case, fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce. Not all individuals survive to adulthood. Selection. The individuals with the best traits, adaptations will survive and have the opportunity to pass on its traits to offspring. Natural selection acts as a phenotype, physical appearance, not the genotype, which is the genetic makeup. When a predator finds its prey, it is due to the prey's physical characteristics like color or slow speed, not the alleles like B and B or B small b. Adaptations. Natural selection is the process by which organisms that can adapt to changes in their environment are able to survive and reproduce. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen with you because I'm running out of time. And I just want to remind you, organisms with heritable genetically determined features that help them survive and reproduce in a particular environment tend to leave more offspring than their peers. If this continues over generations, the heritable features that aid survival and reproduction will become more and more common in that population. The population will not only evolve, change in their genetic makeup or inherited traits, but will evolve in such a way that it becomes adapted to a better suit, to be better suited to its environment. Now, I've run out of time. And so what I'm going to do at this point, if any of you have any questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman and maybe he can answer those questions for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, question, I'll give another example of natural selection. Uh, giraffes. The giraffes have long necks. Some giraffes at one time had shorter necks, but during some droughts and all, all the an, uh, smaller animals ate all the leaves and everything that were low, and the only ones that had any food were the giraffes with the long necks. So the uh, giraffes with the smaller necks, they kind of disappeared. The ones with the long necks survived because they were the only ones that had food. And now we're going to let Ms. Fuller tell us about selective breeding. Hi, boys and girls. I'm going to talk to you uh, for a little while today about selective breeding. So I'm going to start my uh, share with you. So bear with me for just a second. So in this segment, we're going to be discussing selective breeding in animals. Well, Mr. Monroe talked to you about natural selection. Uh, in selective breeding, humans decide who gets to breed and what, what to do with the offspring. So let's talk about agriculture and uh, what are some desirable traits bred into cattle. So first off, we're gonna talk about uh, Black Angus cattle. They're from Scotland. They're very old. Uh, they've got them traced back past the 1600s. They have well-marbled meat. They've got a docile temperament. They're pawed. That means they don't have any horns and they have small calves. All of these are money savers for the rancher. But the well barbled meat makes the Angus meat very desirable. It's very tender, it's very juicy. Um, it's a, got a wonderful flavor. Very often when you go to a steakhouse, it'll have on the menu, we serve all Angus beef. And the reason why is people know that it is reliably uh, tender 
and juicy and delicious. So this has been a selective breeding program over hundreds of years, both in Scotland and in the United States to come up with a breed of cattle that had all these positive characteristics. Now, cattle are also bred for other things. Uh, we've got longhorns here in Texas. It's one of the symbols of our state. Their, uh, their big um, draw, uh, draw is that they're very hardy. They can uh, withstand a, a lack of water for a while. They, they've got tremendous energy and uh, they, they uh, are also good beef cattle. So the longhorn breed almost went out of, uh, went, went extinct. And we just had a few left here in Texas and through selective breeding, that, that uh, breed has come back. And so you see them now on the sides of highways behind the fence with their beautiful horns. The, the lady in the middle is a Holstein. Holstein cattle come from Europe uh, in the Holstein area of Europe. And they are dairy cows. They're the favorite dairy cow in the United States because they make huge quantities of milk and they were selectively bred for this trait. So this particular cow is a moneymaker for the dairy farmer because he can count on the fact that she will make huge quantities of milk. So she was bred for um, and she's a big cow too. Now the, the cow on the far right is a Jersey cow and she was not bred for a tremendous amounts of milk, but because her milk has a very high fat content. And so because of that, she was bred to have this very rich, thick, creamy milk. And these are all different characteristics that different breeds of cattle uh, were uh, selectively bred for. Now, here, what a lovely chicken. Uh, now let's talk about some desirable traits bred into chickens. Now this particular chicken is an Americana. Uh, I actually have one in my room. Uh, they've got very sweet personality. They're reliable layers. She lays an egg every single day. Uh, and uh, she's a good size. So if heaven forfend, uh, someone would wanna eat one, it would be a good uh, eating chicken. Now look at her comb. You see how tiny it is? That's a good trait because if you have terrible, terrible winter, oh, I don't know, like a polar vortex, she is less likely to suffer frostbite on her comb than would a chicken that has a big comb. And um, going back up here to uh, free of embryonic defects, um, the, she is selectively bred. She was actually developed from a different chicken from South America called the Aracana. And the Aracana carries two uh, uh, traits that kill the baby in the, uh, at the embryonic state in the egg. And uh, one is a trait that, that uh, is closely associated with the fact that the Aracana is a rumpless chicken. It doesn't have a big bottom. And the other thing, uh, the uh, Aracana, not the Americana, have big puffy things sticking out the side of their face. And there's also a trait that's closely associated with that or that's carried by that that also kills the babies. So this is selectively bred to come up that eliminated those two negative traits. And here's some different varieties. The one over on the far right, I believe is an Aracana. She doesn't look like my chicken. And some are bred for being fancy, for show, and some are bred uh, for uh, meat, and some are bred for eggs. Now, let's talk about the horse. The horse has only been domesticated about 3,500 years. Uh, the horse on the left is a draft horse. Percheron, and the one on the right is a uh, what's called a Henry Morgan horse, which is used by the army, the cavalry, not so much anymore, uh, but they serve different purposes. The draft horse can pull a lot, and the, but the, uh, the Morgan horse is consistent in the way it looks, and also uh, it's, a, it's a good horse for people to ride. Now, we've got other reasons why people have selective breeding. On the left, you see uh, thorough, thoroughbreds, uh, which are in racing. Uh, and um, 
their special characteristics that they want to perpetuate in a thoroughbred horse, in a racehorse. Now, we're going to talk a little bit longer about the cutting horse and about negative aspects of selective breeding. Now, the horse uh, on the left that's facing the, the cow uh, is a cutting horse. And what they do for a living is they cut cattle out from the herd and let the cowboy doctor the, the, the cow or brand the cow or whatever needs to be done. Well, there was a very famous cutting horse, probably the most famous cutting horse. His name was Poco Bueno. He lived in Wilbarger County. He was owned by Paul Wagner of the famous Wagner Ranch people. And he was the first cutting horse to ever be insured for $100,000. He, he was uh, a grand champion and uh, he was, uh, he had no white on him. He was just a solid dark color. He had a lot and he was a tremendous cutting horse and he was at stud. That means he was used as a stallion to breed mares for four or 500 times. Unfortunately, he died in 1969 and in 1971, they found a genetic trait. And guess who it was linked to? Poco Bueno. So, so many people wanted to breed him to their mares because he had so many spectacular attributes. But it wasn't until after he died that they realized that he had had a genetic uh, trait. Uh, I've got it written down. And uh, it's called... HERDA, H-E-R-D-A, sounds like an a agricultural trait, doesn't it? And uh, its real name is Hereditary uh, Equine uh, uh, Regional Dermal Asthenia. And essentially what it means is the collagen comes uncooked from the skin of the animal and it gets a wound that doesn't heal and then they have to put it down. And it usually doesn't show up until the animal's two years old. So this is one of those situations where selective breeding went wrong. And it, it, they had already, he was already dead when they discovered it, but they're no, learning more and more about genetics now than they did 40, 50, 70, 80 years ago. Okay, pigeons are another uh, uh, agricultural animal that are heavily um, selective breeding. The, the, some for meat, uh, if you've ever eaten squab, you ate a pigeon. Uh, uh, some for like the, the white ones here for show, show animals. Now I wanna tell you that agriculture is your culture. It's the second most important industry uh, in Texas with oil and gas being first and one out of every seven working Texans work in agriculture. And the first five agricultural products in terms of economic impact are beef and calves, cotton, broilers, chickens, uh, greenhouse products and dairy products. I'm out of time. If you have any agricultural or selective breeding questions, Dr. Gorman will be happy to help you. Thank you. Yes, we have a question. Does the Environmental Center participate in any kind of selective breeding? And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, Ms. Fuller talked to you about Angus cattle and about Longhorns both while ago. And we, uh, the Angus cattle has the most tasteful beef, uh, but the Longhorn has the most nutritious. It doesn't taste very because it doesn't have any fat in it, but it's very high in protein. So what we have done is we've taken our black Angus cow, I believe it was obsidian, and we took freckles, our longhorn bull, and we mated them together. And nine months later, they produced a beautiful little calf that had to look like both of them kind of. She's black and white. She's polled like the Angus cattle, not like the Longhorn. She doesn't have any horns at all. And she looks like, uh, she's just our sweetheart out here. Her name is Oreo because she is black and white. Now, the bad thing about it is, or the good thing to us is, we're never gonna find out if we actually produced that real high nutritious, good tasting beef that uh, we think we cross would make because She's not going to be eaten. Uh, thank you. Now I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. 
during this virtual field trip, students examine organisms uh, or their structures and I have a little trouble with this one, use dichotomous keys for identification, explain variation within a population or species and identify some changes in genetic traits that have occurred over several generations through natural selection and selective breeding. Ms. Ramirez covered dichotomous keys. Ms. Nash talked about variation. Mr. Monroe, natural selection. And Ms. Fuller, selective breeding. Thank you for joining us this morning. Teachers would like to know how we did. If you would fill out a form, www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback. It's a very short form. It won't take long. We'd certainly appreciate it if you fill that out and send it to us. Okay, you guys have a great day. Most importantly, you have a great life. Thank you for joining us this morning.